Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. We'll begin with the singing of number 583, 583, Sing to Me of Heaven, 583, we'll sing the first and third verses of this song. Hmm. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the toils that by me it will bring relief. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing, so showers of great blessings o'er my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly drink of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sing the sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me find the drink of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sing the sweetest song of all. I pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for the strength and health that allow us to be out and about this morning. We thank you for the the mindset that has brought us each here this morning, and we pray that all things said and done here will be done in accordance with your will, and we will all be strengthened and uplifted by, by being here and better apt to be good examples to those out in the world. Pray that you'll be with the ones that are not able to be here. We're thankful for the technology that allows us to join with them in worship, and we pray that whatever it is that's keeping them away will be removed, and they will soon be back with us. Thank you for the little rain we received overnight. Pray that you will continue to bless us. We're thank you for Thankful for all the many blessings there. Earthly blessings, the spiritual blessings, all that you have blessed us with, knowing that all good and perfect gifts do come from above. And we're, we're thankful for that. We pray now that as we go throughout this worship service, we'll all be pleasing in your sight. We ask that you'll forgive us of any sins. Pray that you will strengthen us in those things that are upright and good and Defeat us in those things that are evil. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good to have everybody here this morning. And I forgot to tell, tell you that Josh is out of town, so there's no class in the fellowship room. But I guess you guys figured that out by now. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know if we've got to switch something over here. Yeah, switch that over. Oh, yeah, that's right. Zach is out of town, but we got capable guys back there. Anyway, we are in our study of marriage and the family, and uh, we're looking at passages, main passages, where we are now, looking at main passages dealing with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And uh, we looked at the Old Testament passages, and so this morning we are going to get into the New Testament passages. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter um, 5. And uh, we still need this coming up here. At least it would be nice to have it, but we all remember the time we didn't have that kind of thing. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus is teaching. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, yeah, let's see, there's something over here. Anyway, he's going to work on that. All right, but in Matthew chapter 5, um, yeah, 
He's working on it. Okay. Matthew chapter 5, 31 and 32, and um, of course I have it all on the slide. Yeah, there you go, right here. Um, Matthew chapter 5, 31 and 32, this is in a section that I like to call truth versus tradition, truth versus tradition. And uh, this, of course, is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he gives the Beatitudes in the first 10 verses, and then he gives reaction to those Beatitudes in verses 11 through 16. Uh, and then in verse 17 and 18, uh, actually 17 through 20, you know, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, uh, you will by no means enter in the kingdom of heaven. And then verses 21, all the way through the end of the chapter, he has this section, like verse 21, you have heard that it was said by those of old. And then in verse 22, but I say unto you. And then down in verse um, uh, 31, 26, uh, well, well, these are not marked. Uh, yeah, uh, verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, Verse 28, but I say unto you, verse 31, furthermore it has been said, verse 32, but I say to you, verse 33, again you have heard that it was said uh, to those of old, verse 34, but I say unto you, verse 38, you have heard that it was said, verse 39, but I tell you, and then verse 43, you have heard that it was said, verse 44, but I say to you. And this whole section, what he's talking about, when he says you have heard it was said by those of old time, he's saying here's tradition. Uh, and and most, most of the time, until he gets to the very last one, he'll quote something from the Old Testament, which is true. You know, you shall not murder, kill, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery and all that. But how they were translating that, how their tradition taught was not scriptural. And so this whole section deals with that. And again, when Jesus says, but I say unto you, he is not adding to what Moses says. He is not correcting what Moses said, but he is telling them what God through Moses was saying all along. But because of centuries of tradition, uh, you have not caught on to that. And so we'll just say that, that that hand sanitizer is the truth that Moses wrote but over the centuries, they put a tradition. Then they'd have tradition on tradition, 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 so that by the time you get to the first century, we'll say this is the first century right here, there's a wall of tradition that they don't know the truth. And so you have heard it said by them of old time, but I tell you, so Jesus goes back to what the truth always said, and that's what Jesus teaches here. All right, now the one in particular that concerns us is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. He says, furthermore, uh, it has been said, and actually if you go back up to verse 27, uh, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than, they, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, uh, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality <clears throat> causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced uh, commits adultery through verse 32. But you do have in verse 27, you shall not commit adultery, and that is one of the Ten Commandments. But how they interpreted that by the time the tradition reached the first century, and probably long before that, uh, their interpretation was, uh, you know, as long as you didn't uh, have, have sex with her, then it was okay. But Jesus says, no. If you look at her to lust after her, you've done it already in your heart. And with the one before this about anger, whosoever is angry at his brother without a cause, Jesus goes to the heart, to the root of the situation. In other words, if a person never lusts on anybody, he will never commit adultery. If you don't have the lust, you'll never commit adultery. Uh, just like if you're, if you're never angry at your brother without a cause, you'll never murder him, okay? And so he gets down to the heart of things. But uh, then verse 31, 
Uh, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now, that goes back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Uh, that's not in the Ten Commandments, but it does go back to Deuteronomy 24, and that's why we spent considerable time on that a few weeks ago, Deuteronomy 24, and it'll come up again. Uh, but then he says, I say unto you, whosoever uh, divorces his wife, except it be for fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries her, a woman that is put away, does commit adultery. All right, and now tradition, they could put away their wife for any cause. And of course, you know, when we look at Deuteronomy 24, you know, the, the extreme of that would be this as well. Uh, but again, and he'll develop this more in, do, in Matthew chapter 19 because an appeal is made there as well, and uh, a direct appeal to that. All right, now here's some, some vocabulary in this that we need to, to look at. All right, divorce, uh, put away uh, in the King James, and sends away in the New American Standard. That comes from word apoluo, which means to let go, to send away, dismiss, and divorce. And uh, the word occurs a ton of times in the New Testament, and sometimes the word is translated forgive, because forgiving is a letting go, it's a sending away of sin, it's a demissal of sin, if you will, and uh, that happens to be Luke's, Luke 6, 47, that's Luke's account that, you know, uh, if we don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will our Father forgive us, and, uh, and that's just to fit on that one line, but there's all kinds of verses where that word is used. But the basic meaning is to let go, to send away, all right? Um, now, the word translated certificate of divorce, uh, that's a very interesting word. The word is apostasion. What does apostasion sound like? Apostasy, right. And so that's the same word we get apostasy from. And an apostasy is a... Falling away, I mean the word in, in 2 Thessalonians to the great falling away or the apostasy. And so it's very interesting that that's what's used for a certificate of divorce in the New Testament. And so, so a divorce is kind of like an apostasy uh, of marriage, if you will, uh, a marriage apostasy. But it's a legal term for the relinquishment of property after sale, abandonment, etc., and I have Deuteronomy 24 right there, which we'll just go back to that again just to refresh our memory. Deuteronomy 24 and uh, verses 1 through 4. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. And remember, Deuteronomy is a, is a uh, second giving of the law. It's a reminder to that generation that's about to go into the promised land. Remember, they had to wander 40 years uh, because of the 10 unfaithful spies. And... Um, you know, all the fighting men, aged 20 years and upward, would die in the wilderness except for two, Joshua and Caleb. And so Deuteronomy, remember at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. He's allowed to go up on Mount Nebo and see the promised land, but he's never allowed to enter it. Joshua would take them in. But the whole book of Deuteronomy is a reminder to that second generation of what God said and the covenant that they were under. And so Deuteronomy 24, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, all right? And we looked at that again a couple weeks ago, and so you can go back and look at the YouTube video, but the first three verses are conditions. This, this all Verses 1 through 4 is a big if-then statement. Verses 1 through 3 are the if part, if this, if this, if this, if this, if this is present, then, and the only imperative, the only command is in verse 4, then the former husband who divorced her shall not take her back to be his wife uh, after she has been defiled, okay? And so that's the only command. And the whole reason for that was to really to protect the, the wife who is put away. Uh, remember, I kind of used the illustration of a yo-yo, 
but even some younger folks know what that is, you know, and, um, you know, the yo-yo, you, you, you throw it away, and it comes back to you. It comes back to you. It's on a little string there. It comes right back to you. And so this would prevent that husband from playing her like a yo-yo, like we see so much in our culture. Uh, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. Then he changes his mind and wants her back again. Get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. Change his mind and wants her back again. And this would prevent that. Plus, it would legitimize the second marriage. Uh, but as, and we'll save, save, save that for Matthew 19, 9, but as Jesus said there, because of the hardness of your heart, God allowed you to put them away. All right, also I have up here Jeremiah 3, and this is a very important passage. Turn, turn to Jeremiah 3, and uh, this is often used to try to show that all adultery is spiritual adultery. And that, of course, is not the case at all. In fact, the figurative use of adultery comes from the literal use of adultery. And so we should consider adultery as a literal thing unless something in the context demands otherwise. All right? And so in Jeremiah chapter 3, and uh, just to set, set up Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah is prophesying to apostate Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, and he is in and around the city of Jerusalem uh, prophesying, and prophesying doesn't always mean telling the future, although that's involved. But prophesying sometimes means interpreting the past, it sometimes means telling people what's going on right now, and it also talks about uh, the future. Now, when I say right now, I'm talking about right now in the time of the prophets, okay? In his contemporary time, he tells what's going on at that point. Uh, and so Jeremiah, again, he's dealing with apostate Israel. So if you start up in verse 1, uh, they say if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, he... Uh, may he return to her again. Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. All right? And so they, this is definitely spiritual adultery, which again, as we pointed out, well, maybe we haven't pointed out, but I think we've mentioned it, but we'll definitely get into it in 1 Corinthians 7. But uh, literal idolatry often involved literal fornication, Okay? Uh, especially when, you're, when, when pagans are worshiping the fertility god, for example, or goddess, uh, it would involve sexual relations as part of worship. Uh, and it depends on the different religion and cult and all that, but it could involve that as well. All right, but he is talking to Judah here, and so he says that, and uh, yet return to me at the end of verse 1 there, yet return to me, says the Lord. You know, God, throughout Jeremiah, even though they deserve to be destroyed and they're going to be destroyed, God is always reaching out, repent. He's always given them that opportunity to repent, all right? Verse 2, lift up your eyes uh, to the desolate heights and see where, uh, where have you not lain with men. By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore, showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me, My father, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. All right? Now, uh, verse 4, will you not? Yeah, and actually, verse, this all is talking about places of idolatry. You can see idolatry all over the land of Judah, by the roadside, here, there, and everywhere. Uh, but in verse 4, will you not from this time cry to me, my father, you are the guilt or you are the guide of my youth. That's a call to repentance right there. Won't you at this time repent, go back, you're the guide for my youth, let me be your guide again. In other words, uh, will he remain angry for, forever? And the implication is no, if you repent, he won't be. Will he keep it to the end? No, he won't be if you repent. Behold, you have spoken and done evil as you were able. All right, now verse 6, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you not seen what backsliding Israel has done? All right, now Israel is the northern kingdom. And um, when he says here, so you can look at the north. Now, when, when, when this is spoken, the northern kingdom Israel have been taken captive a long time ago by the Assyrian, all right? Judah will be taken captive by the Babylonians, all right? 
uh, she has gone up, but he's using Israel, the northern kingdom, as an example, as an illustration of, of in this case, of his, of, of this right here, but, um, and Ezekiel will do this as well. He'll call Israel, Samaria, the older sister. And if you were to learn from what your older sister had done, uh, you would not be going through what you're going to go through in a moment. And by the way, while Jeremiah is preaching in and around Jerusalem, Ezekiel is with the captives among the river Kibar, telling them what's going on. And Daniel is in the palaces of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, telling, you know, what's going on to the king, okay? And so God has a prophet at the same time, every major place his people are, okay? Keeping them informed and giving them hope and give, giving them opportunities to repent. All right, but in the middle of verse 6, talking about backsliding Israel, what she has done, she has gone up uh, on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. Now, high mountains and green trees are places of idolatry. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return to me. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees, yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart but in pretense, says the Lord. And then she said to me, backsliding Israel, et cetera, et cetera. But he never gave a certificate of divorce to backsliding Judah, all right? He did to Israel, which as I was going back over this last night, I got to thinking, man, wow. Um, never hit me before, but, you know, Israel would never return. I mean, Israel or Judah would never return as a divided kingdom, all right? Um, after the captivity. Now, we did have a remnant from all 12 tribes come back, and Israel was again, the remnant of Israel was again there, and thus Christ would come back. But Israel, the northern kingdom, would never return as a political entity ever again. And perhaps this certificate of divorce would be another uh, cooperation of that uh, in the Old Testament. But needless to say, uh, that certificate of divorce in, in Jeremiah 3, verse 8, was issued to the northern kingdom, not the southern kingdom of Judah. And, uh, of course, a remnant would come back from all of them. Um, but Jeremiah 3, 8, yes, that is spiritual adultery, but the context clearly tells us that. Uh, idolatry is spiritual adultery, okay? All right, um, any questions or comments on that? Uh, well, that's the tradition part of that. All right, truth taught, on the other hand, remember, you know, tradition versus truth. You have heard it said by them of old, tradition. But the truth uh, is what Jesus says, again, going back to Matthew 5, 32. But I say unto you, um, whoever divorces his wife except for, for sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. And so the word except there tells us there's only one reason for divorce and remarriage, okay? And that is except it be for fornication. But that word except, though it's a different phrase, um, but that word except in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven except a man be born of water and the spirit. He cannot enter uh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so there's no way to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no way. It's impossible. Except if you're born of the water and the spirit. Uh, and so that's the exception there. And I don't have them up there, uh, but all the other gospels, Matthew, or actually Mark and Luke, uh, will have, will give no reason for remarriage but Matthew gives, uh, well, no, or death would be the only reason for remarriage if you just go by Mark and Luke. But Matthew has in there except to be for fornication. And so Matthew adds that exception clause uh, to that, all right? Now, some, some people will make a big deal about that. We'll get into that 
We're going to talk, we have a whole lesson uh, uh, dedicated to various views of Matthew 19, 9, and we'll bring that up uh, in that lesson there. But, uh, you know, you look at the audiences to which these Gospels were written. Uh, Mark was written mainly to Romans. Uh, Luke was written to Gentiles. And Matthew was written to Jews. And so perhaps with Mark and Luke, it was, it was a given. Yeah, duh, if your spouse dies, you can remarry. Uh, and so they don't go on to give the exception clause. But um, Matthew does here. But we'll, again, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, except you repent, uh, Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And so, you know, there's another word, uh, use of the word except. All right, except it be for sexual immorality. I mentioned this before. I do not like the translations, including the New King James that I'm reading from, that have sexual immorality. Uh, that seems kind of uh, very watered down to me. Uh, to me, looking at pornography or going to a strip joint or anything like that, that would be, to me, that, that would be sexually immoral, uh, but that's not what fornication is. That stuff is still sin, okay? Pornica uh, I mean, uh, pornication. Uh, porn, pornography. <laughs> pornication. Hey, I like that. Pornication. Anyway, uh, pornography, I don't like it. The practice, I like to coin the term there. See, I just accidentally coined the term there. Um, but anyway, pornography and going to a strip club are definitely immoral, and a person will go to hell if he doesn't repent from that, but that's not the same thing as fornication. Mm -hmm. Well, is Jesus kind of putting a slam on Abram? On, on, on who? Abram. Or Abraham? Abram? No, 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 no. Well, the last one, yeah. cause for her to commit. Read yeah, the last yeah. One. It, it's, she, he is putting her in a situation. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get to that quite. You you said Abraham, right? Because Abraham had multiple. What's that? Yeah, but you're talking about his 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 different wives, or yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He lied about that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, not not really, but it could be. But, but we'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute. All right, but uh, sexual immorality, fornication, the King James has. I believe ASV 921 is fornication. Unchastity is better than sexual immorality. Um, and maybe, maybe we know what unchastity is these days. Um, I think there's still enough influence that most people know what fornication is. Um, but anyway, the definition here is classic uh, lexical definition. It means prostitution. Yeah, I didn't put the Greek word up there just because it'd bump it down an extra line, but the Greek word is pornea, which is the same word we get pornography from, and how pornography first started out, it was writing about prostitution. <clears throat> and that's why prostitution is in there. You know, graf, grafe means to write like graffiti. Uh, porne is sexual immorality, okay, whatever, writing about that. But the word is prostitution, unchastity, fornication, and uh, of every kind of unlawful sexual interaction. Every kind of unlawful sexual interaction. And I've made the comparison before back, you know, my generation, locker room talk, you know, the guys would talk about if they hit a home run with the girl they were with the, uh, the night before. And uh, I know the home run was, you know, having that fornication, fornicating with her. Uh, first base would have been maybe kissing her, I don't know, holding hands, whatever. I don't know what second and third would be. I don't know. Uh, but the whole point of that is, you know, God, God you know, we, we don't want to see how close we can get to actual copulation. Uh, and actual copulation is not, I mean, that's fornication for sure. But even before that is fornication. At what point before that, I'm going to let God be the judge of that, not me. But don't even get close to that. Stay as far away as you can from that. I don't have it here. I should have put it here, even if it did bump it down another line. But 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, verse 1, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But, verse 2, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her, or let every woman have her own husband. And so it's, and in that context, he's saying it's better to remain single, and he tells us why in that context, verse 26 and verse 28, 
there's some kind of trouble in the flesh going on. Uh, there's some kind of, um, um, what's the word, a present distress. A present distress is going on, probably uh, persecution related. And then he says, if you do marry, you haven't sinned, verse 28, nevertheless, you will have trouble in the flesh, okay? And so there's that, that's the reason why he's saying that. But at least three times in that chapter, he says, you still haven't sinned if you marry. And at least twice he said it's better to marry than to commit fornication. It's better to marry than to burn in your own lust in verse 9. And so, you know, that, that, that's just a temporary situation that he says it's good not to marry. But even if you marry, you haven't sinned. But again, we'll spend a couple weeks on that. Uh, but anyway, uh, sexual immorality, all right? Um, but yeah, 1 Corinthians 7. And so notice verse 1, it's, it's good not to touch a woman. And then verse 2, nevertheless to avoid fornication. So you see how he uses touch and fornication as kind of parallel referring to the same thing. And so some touching, I would argue, is fornication. And, of course, when preachers get together, you know, and they just, you know, over a cup of coffee or whatever, and they pick each other's brains, you know, which is a good thing to do. Um, and so one of those brain-picking sessions I was asked, well, if, if fornication has to involve copulation, then what about two lesbians? They don't copulate. Well, you know, you got that right, but it doesn't involve just copulation, okay? Uh, and if you don't know what that means, I guess look it up. But <laughs> Okay, um, but anyway, um, that's that. All right, all right, but anyway, so, but yeah, and as we mentioned, fornication is really an umbrella term, an umbrella term, and includes adultery, which is, uh, sex outside of marriage where at least one person is married. It includes premarital sex where neither one is married. It includes homosexuality, uh, Romans 1, 26 and 27. It would include bestiality, and uh, there were specific commands about that in the Old Testament, which was sometimes part of idolatry. Uh, and so any illicit, and yeah, by the way, unlawful here in that definition is not civil law. It's unlawful according to God's law. And so any unauthorized sexual interaction uh, would fit under the umbrella term of fornication, okay? And so um, th this would involve adultery here since it's involving married people, but he does use the word except it be for fornication. All right, and then uh, as Dennis pointed out, uh, the phrase here, well, actually Jesus pointed out and Dennis made a comment on, uh, causes her to commit an adultery, all right? Now, uh, whoever puts her away, let's see, um, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever marries her who is put away, all right? But causes her to commit adultery. Now, when you, you think about that term, causes her. I mean, there's a sense in which nobody else makes us sin, but there is a sense in which other people can be said to make us sin. And so uh, I think, and I'll give you some information on this here in a moment, but just the, 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 the definition right here. Uh, I think that this best uh, is, un is best understood as the husband indirectly making her to commit adultery by leaving her vulnerable. And uh, here's a quote here, and I'll give an a biblical illustration after this. Uh, but here's a quote from J.W. McGarvey in his commentary on Matthew and Mark. Uh, he says, a woman when divorced, especially in the first century. Now, now he writes these comments in the late 1800s, does McGarvey. Uh, maybe the early 1900s, but I think the late 1800s. Uh, and so even in that culture, uh, probably would be the same. Yeah, have you ever seen Gone with the Wind? Oh, yeah, Gone with the Wind? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. <laughs> if you tried to read the book, man, you'd be like that skeleton guy on the bench, you know, waiting to read. But anyway, um, but even in that, in that era in America, divorce was kind of, you know, kind of unheard of, you know. You wanted to keep it in the closet type of thing. Of course, old Scarlett, she didn't care about all those social norms in her day. O'Hara, go ahead. Uh, but while it's coming there, but the culture was like this in that day. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope this is not too far offline. I, th I don't think it is, but uh, in camp one time, uh, uh, we were talking about marriage and divorce at, uh, at uh, Wikiwachi. And there was a, two teenage uh, a teenage couple, boyfriend, girlfriend, and I used them as an example. I said, so, uh, so you really, really care for this person. 
So you think in your head the most best thing in this whole world to prove my love for that person is to give myself to them sexually. Now, I don't think it's thought through, and as I pointed out to them, now, why would you, someone that you care so much about, want to give them sex outside of marriage knowing that you have committed a sin which would cost both your souls? If you truly love that person, why would you not teach them that you cannot do this and that your life is promised to God and that's where you need to be? You want to love somebody, show them how much you love them, teach them about Christ, bring them to Christ. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself sexually is not the way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that'll come up more so in a moment. Um, but yeah, that's true. Uh, of course, people don't think that these days. Uh, they think having sex is like French kissing some of them. I mean, you know, and that ain't the case. That ain't the case. Uh, anyway, that's not the case. Excuse me. That's not the case. All right. Uh, let me read, finish reading this. Does someone have a comment there? We'll finish. Okay. Uh, but he says, uh, a woman when divorced naturally seeks a second marriage if for no other reason than to vindicate herself from the imputation cast on her by the divorce. The second husband in accepting her hand pronounces against the act of the first husband, but her second marriage is adultery, uh, and her first husband indirectly causes her to commit this crime. And, of course, he, he didn't say that in there, I don't know, but, but added to that would be, you know, just for physical support. I mean, especially in the first century, in most, most of the cultures of the first century, you know, a woman divorced was on her own. I mean, she, she was outcast from society, uh, had, she had no one to take care of her, maybe her family would take her back in, but even that was probably rare because, you know, there was a stigma with that as well. And so uh, they would seek, is that me, is that the sound, is the sound messing up? Yeah, it is. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I could be, oh, anyway, anyway, all right. But anyway, the, um, so she would, she would, and, you know, a woman divorced in most cultures in the first century would seek a man right away. And without thinking twice, well, maybe without thinking twice about it, as the expression goes, she would seek him right away just so that she would have that support and that security that a man would offer. All right, now, causing her to, um, causing others to sin without overriding free will is best illustrated, in my mind, by Jeroboam. And um, this is important right here. Uh, without overriding free will, okay? We have free will. A woman who is divorced unscripturally has free will, and so she doesn't have to marry somebody else, but she most likely would try to, and so Jesus has given this, this, this thing about don't do it. Think twice about it. Go ahead, uh, Tyler. Looking back on that last slide you had up, it's a very archaic way of thinking, unfortunately because it's putting everything on the woman. Right. And, or I'm sorry, it's putting the husband, by the last line, indirectly causes her to commit this crime. Mm -hmm. Today's society, women get divorces from their husband all the time. Women, women are, do not always want the divorce. Men, right. men do, or men don't want the divorce, women do. Mm -hmm. So it's putting everything in, up there, and it says there's no reason other than to vindicate herself from the imputation if she's done nothing wrong. Right. So the way that this is being explained is very archaic in way of thinking. Yeah. Compared to our day and age, yes. But that's not the case in the first century. In the first century, it was the men who almost always initiated the divorce. Now, some some Roman cultures that where they were, you know, higher up and all that, but Jewish culture for sure, it would be the men who would initiate that. And your statement about, um, you know, yes, there are men that put away women and they don't want anything to do with it. It's the other way around too. And in our culture, my understanding, it only takes one person to file for divorce and it goes through. And then the other person has no say so about it. Um, but even in our culture, in my day and age, my young 50 eight or nine years, born in 63, not good at math, but I know women who were put away that did nothing wrong, but 
even church members attach that stigma to them. And even, even society did that. And, uh, and, that, and, that, and we've come a long way. We've got a long ways to go, but I think that's one major issue, and this comes out when I teach on 1 Corinthians 7. comes out quite a bit. Um, we, we, we can't be treating divorced people as second-class citizens of the kingdom. And I think a lot of people have done that in the past. Church members especially have done that in the past. And uh, even if it was their fault, the woman's fault or the man's fault, if they repented. Now, that doesn't mean they can remarry but necessarily. But if they repent, uh, we need to do that. But yeah, the woman, up until fairly recent times, has always been looked at as the cause of it and all that kind of stuff. And I think that kind of goes back to misunderstandings of Adam and Eve. Go ahead, George. Verse 32 of Matthew 5. But I say to you that uh, whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of fornication makes her to commit adultery. That expression, makes her to commit adultery. Um, would we agree that uh, what's in un something's to be understood here? And that is, uh, she does not commit adultery by the virtue of the fact that she right. has been put away. Right. She commits, a, a, the, ass the assumption is that she's yeah. going to get, she's going to marry somebody else in that situation. Yeah. She's apt to yeah. and will have sexual relations with somebody else. Yeah. So all of that is, is uh, assumed here. It's not as if once she's put away, right. then she commits adultery. Right. So the assumption is she's then in a yeah. situation where she'll marry somebody else, and in marriage, she's likely going to have sex. Yeah, and that's, that's what this quote is all about. And that's why I say she doesn't have to do that, but in a lot of cases she would just to have that security. And again, you know, our culture is way different, but even our culture 100 years ago was close to this. Uh, if not like that, and, and, and quote, what I call quote, and maybe I'm coining another phrase, but church culture, quote unquote, I know back in the 1980s and 90s was like this. I've known personally situations like this uh, where the woman got blamed even though it wasn't her fault she did nothing wrong. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in many cases that's the case, yeah, in general whether marriage or not, you know, in general. But, but uh, getting back to this before we run out of time, and this kind of goes back to what um, Tyler observed as well, that, well, kind of kind of goes along with that, but causing others to sin without overriding free will is best illustrated by Jeroboam. We won't look at all these. We'll look at this one here, 2 Kings 10, 29 through 31. But remember, Jeroboam set up that false system of worship in the northern kingdom. It's detailed right here. He made his own priesthood. He made his own feast days, very similar to the ones in Judah, that they were the authorized ones, uh, but it wasn't the same. Uh, made it a religion of convenience also, so they didn't have to go down to Jerusalem. Uh, this is where it all starts, but Jer well, Jeroboam, well, this is where it starts, but Jeroboam, let's see if you can finish out this phrase. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which caused Israel to sin. Uh, I think like 10 times or more, maybe 7 to 10 times, yeah, that phrase is Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, caused Israel to sin. Which caused Israel to sin, all right? Well, so here you have Jeroboam causing people to sin. Well, how did he cause people to sin? Well, he made, that, this, he made it that, but only when people follow the sins of others are the others said to cause them to sin. And so look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 10, 29. 1 Kings chapter 10, 29. Or 2 Kings, okay. 2 Kings. I hope that's right. I think it is. Let's see. 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 29 through... Um, ten twenty nine. Um... However, Jehu did not, turn, uh, did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that is, from the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight and have done to, to, to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your son shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation." But Jehu took no heed 
to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam who made Israel to sin. And so what it is is Jehu, he did destroy the house of Ahab, and so because of that, uh, he, his sons would rule to the fourth generation, but notice he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, and so he would be condemned for that. Uh, and so here, you know, Jehu wasn't forced to worship like this, but he chose to. And so the woman, applying that back into Matthew, is that the woman, she doesn't have to marry. But again, as George said, it's anticipated that she will because, again, she, it would be very tempting in that culture for her to do that. And so Jesus says, you better think twice before doing that because, um, because of that. All right, but again, it does illustrate a really good point here that we have to, you know, we don't, we don't take our culture and read it back into the Bible. We have to take that culture and the best we can understand about that culture, which is from, you know, the context, uh, vocabulary words that are used, other things, you know, like that. And then we take that culture, because that's the culture it was given in, and then we take that and apply it to our culture, not read our culture back into that. Go ahead. Would we say that the man who put her away, as explained here, without fornication, mm -hmm. uh, not only commits the sin yeah. of doing that, that's a sin. Yes. But in addition, he bears responsibility yeah. for her uh, in the situation that he's putting her in. Yeah, absolutely. There's a second problem that he's doing. Yeah, because and that's the same with Jeroboam. He sinned in doing this to begin with, but then he also sinned because of all the people that are going to follow that. You got a remark back there. And I like to point situations like this out for our influence. This is one reason why judgment cannot be properly given until the end of all time. Because the influence still lives. Like it said of Abel, by it being dead in Hebrews 11 verse 4, by it being dead, what? Yet speaks, okay? Influence continues on. And so you take a guy like Adolf Hitler, he did a, a terrible things, but does, does Adolf Hitler's influence still live on? Absolutely. Man, just every, about every other year you hear about maybe a Jewish daycare being blown up on Hitler's birthday, okay? Well, why would they pick that day? Well, his influence is still going on. And so even though God knows uh, everything, he's omniscient, but you know, full judgment cannot be given until this world ceases because that's you know, when all the influence ceases. Just very quickly, when God first appeared to Jeroboam, he promised him that he would oh, yeah. make him a nation. Oh, yeah. But Jeroboam and, the, and his people there, were worried that the Jew that the Israelites would start going over to Jerusalem. That's why he made the two golden calves. Mm -hmm. He did not have faith. Yeah. Yeah, and Jeroboam, there's no excuse for this. Yeah, no excuse for that. Uh, go ahead. Also in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, mm -hmm. uh, 7, 1, and it goes on concerning the things the principles of married life. Yeah. So in God's word, whether it be back with Israel or now, he, he gives us everything. Even with the marriage, if you choose someone to marry, mm -hmm. then he's saying here, these are some things that you oh, need yeah. to be doing so that you can stay married. Yeah. And, verse, you know, yep. so 1 Corinthians 7. Yeah. Or, Particularly verses 3 through 5 there, yeah. he tells you. We'll get into all that, believe you me. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. What you got? Pertaining again to the influence so that we put people in certain situations and thereby uh, bear at least some responsibility, I think of the uh, politicians in this country uh, and the judges. Uh, for example, on this uh, gay marriage thing back in 2015, where they're endorsing it as being good behavior or whatever. Uh, look at the influence that that's having today. Yeah. And they bear some responsibility of that on the Day of Judgment. Yeah. Yeah, and so there, there's all kinds of ways we influence people. And so, um, but influence, influence lives on well after we're gone, at least uh, among certain people. All right. Uh, well, for next week, it's going to be this one. Uh, and there's a little, little difference, and we'll probably spend as much time on all 
however many verses that is, nine or ten of those verses, and we did on all these just two verses because a lot of the groundwork in Matthew 19, 3 through 12 has already been laid with the vocabulary and all that kind of stuff going on here. All right, appreciate your attention. Let's end in a brief prayer. Loving God and gracious Father, we're so thankful for your word, so thankful for the principles that we learn from it. And Father, as we study these passages on marriage, divorce and remarriage, help us to accept your will and make the application to our lives that we may have stronger marriages and that we may be able better to teach others your will about marriage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.